Okay, everybody, thank you for joining. Welcome to our workshop on how to do research and get published. And today we will be talking about what it takes to get published in an academic journal, specifically focused on how to get more involved with the journal and develop your career. Today, we're joined by a very illustrious panel. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to Simran Korotor, man Associate Managing Editor in the Open Access Journals team at SAGE. She works primarily on the oncology title, Technology and Cancer Research and Treatment, and also on cancer control, where she is involved in manuscript processing and guiding journal strategy to support the growth and reach of her journals. Simran is involved in trialing new strategies and applications in OA, holding a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science, and a Master of Science in Neuroscience and Translational Medicine. We're also joined by Isaac Hirsch, a Senior Editorial Assistant on the STM Journals editorial team. He manages a list of society and proprietary journals, collaborating closely with editors, society partners, and other SAGE departments. He also supports our team of STM publishing editors, conducts trainings, and is involved with our abstracting and indexing committee, working to enhance the visibility and impact of journals published at SAGE. Isaac joined SAGE in 2018 with a bachelor's degree in English from CSU Channel Islands. Next, Dr. Babalolu Fasero is a tenured professor of population health, family medicine, and community health at the University of Kansas Medical Center, and consultant medical epidemiologist at the Kansas Department of Health and Environment in the U.S. He received a medical degree from Obafemi Awolowu University in Nigeria and obtained his Master of Public Arts from the University of Kupio in Finland for, with the Cancer Research Fellowship Award from the World Health Organization, uh, International Agency for Research in Cancer. Dr. Fasero's research is focused on cancer prevention and control with special emphasis on tobacco dependence and smoking cessation. He is director of the University of Kansas Tobacco Treatment Education Program and the chair of the Diversity Inclus Inclusion and Equity Committee for the Council of Tobacco Treatment Training Programs. He is the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Substance Use and Addiction Journal. We're also joined by Dr. Gilbert or Gil G., a Professor and Chair of the Department of Community Health Sciences at UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health. His research focuses on the social determinants of racial and ethnic health inequities, particularly the role of racism. His research has been honored with accolades such as the Merit Award for the National Institutes of Health, a Scientific and Technical Achievement Award from the Environmental Protection Agency, and an Innovative Public Health Curriculum Award from the Delta Omega Honorary Society. He was the former Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Health and Science Behavior. And related to the webinar, he has just published a new book titled, You Can Publish Your Journal Article, Advice from Editors to Help You Succeed, which we will share a link to after the webinar. And I am Sean Skarsberg, a marketing manager on the author marketing team at SAGE. My primary role is to provide support to authors and reviewers as they move through the publishing process, with a particular focus on providing targeted resources at the appropriate time in the publication process. I have a BA in history from Manhattan College and an MA in history from Hunter College, and I'm based out of New York. So today, as we go through the webinar, if you have any questions, please do submit them. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A chat function the Q&A function. This is where you can submit any questions you may have for our, our panelists. While you're while we're going, if you can look through that and you see any questions you particularly like, please do upvote them and we'll start with those at the start. And now this chart illustrates a timeline of the typical author journey, moving from the early stages of securing funding, conducting research, all the way through peer review and publication. So today we're focusing specifically on how to get more involved with the journal and develop your career. We encourage you to go back and watch recordings of other topics we've covered in the series, including how to write and format a manuscript and how to navigate the peer review process. And now I'm happy to pass it over to Isaac. Thank you, Sean. So uh, as Sean mentioned, the main question here is how do I get more involved with the journal? Well, before you can really get more involved with the journal, first things first, you want to focus on building your research portfolio. And to do so, you want to conduct your own original research and then seek to get it published. This will take time, of course, but it is absolutely crucial to establishing yourself within your field. When you're submitting, always be sure to identify journals that align with your research area before you submit your work. And editors can generally tell when a prospective author is serious about submitting to a journal based on the effort put forth during the submission phase. Next, it is important to intend, uh, attend excuse me, and present your research at 
uh, workshops and conferences to gain exposure and to connect with other professionals in your field. And while you're there, be sure to expand your network with those researchers, professors, journal editors, so on and so forth. Because who you go or who you know goes a long way with getting involved with the journal. To know, uh, we also have a great webinar session from last year on attending conferences and how to network. So be sure to check that out for supporting resources. Next, don't forget to stay active and read the latest research in your field to build and maintain a strong uh, knowledge base. Seek to collaborate with experienced researchers on joint pr uh, projects. And then lastly, consider looking for a mentorship from an established professional from within your field who can really guide you. Once you have built a solid research portfolio and network, getting more involved with a journal becomes so much simpler. Next slide, please. So peer review is the best way to get started. Uh, it's very easy and it helps and it's a great uh, stepping stone into getting more involved with the journal. So uh, first I ask, do you already serve as a peer reviewer? If not, uh, put together a list of journals relevant to your research or discipline and offer to be a reviewer. Journals love reviewers and are often seeking new reviewers. So this is a perfect way to get started. And some journals even have a reviewer in training pro program, which helps provide guidance and mentorship to new reviewers. Sage also has great resources available on how to conduct peer review so that it, at any level you want to start with peer review, you will always have multiple resources for your support. The next question is, how many times have you reviewed for a peer reviewed journal? It's important to keep track of this because becoming a regular and reliable reviewer really supports your reputation within the journal and of course your field and helps further develop your own research portfolio. If you are keen to volunteer more with a journal, let the editor of that journal know, but of course you'll need to consider the next question which asks about your quality as a reviewer. Are you able to provide reviews in a timely manner as well as provide thoughtful, constructive criticism to the papers you are asked to review? Because this re really reveals a lot about your quality, your skill, and your consistency as a reviewer, and ultimately showcases whether or not you're capable of handling more. Next slide, please. So uh, real quick, just to expand a bit more on peer review itself and why it's valuable in publishing, here's a quote from the conversation. Peer review is a process where scientists or peers evaluate the quality of other scientists' work. By doing this, the goal is to ensure that the work is rigorous, coherent, uses past research, and adds to what is already known. So the process of peer review is an integral part of publishing one's research and absolutely essential to ensuring the quality of research published. Peer review helps filter out poor quality articles, uh, it assesses the validity of the science behind the manuscript, and helps maintain scientific integrity. And additionally, it also helps to make uh, already good quality manuscripts even stronger. So peer reviewers tend to be seasoned in their discipline. They're well-versed in the scientific literature and usually have good constructive suggestions for authors. So by you becoming a peer reviewer, it is one of the best first steps into getting involved with a journal and is essential to your career as a researcher. And with that, I'll pass it along to Dr. Fesseru, who will speak more about the process of peer review itself. Thank you very much. Um, we'll spend a moment to examine the overall peer review process and highlight the core role peer reviewers have in the process. After a paper is submitted, it is checked for compliance with journal guidelines uh, for things such as correct formatting, referencing style, and for fit with the journal's aims and scope. If it passes these checks, it is sent to peer reviewers. In most cases, peer reviewers are matched to a paper based on the keywords provided in the paper, or the keywords provided by the reviewer if they, are, they have it created in their account, or to keywords in articles the reviewer has authored. Some journals hoped to include an editorial board member and if someone's work is cited in the paper, uh, we may reach out to them as well. So we look for someone with methods expertise and someone with content expertise. Then reviewers are invited to review and once they accept the invitation, 
they will have access to the paper in their reviewer center in the peer review system. Uh, for SAGE, this is called SAGE track. Once reviewers have accessed the paper and prepared comments for the editor and authors, they then make a recommendation of revision, reject or accept to the editor in the system. The editor can then make a final decision based on the recommendations from the reviewers. Next slide, please. So there are three main types of peer review. We have the single anonymous, the double anonymous, and open or transparent peer review. Single anonymous peer review is where the name of the reviewer is, he is hidden from the author. Double anonymous means names are hidden from both the reviewers and the authors. The Hopon peer review is only embraced by a small handful of journals at the moment. And it is when everyone is openly identified, the author is identified, the reviewers are identified. If the journal embraces single or double anonymous peer review, please note that reviewer confidentiality is strictly maintained. So be sure to read the guidelines, the submission guidelines, so that you can understand which type of peer review uh, the journal you're submitting to uses. Uh, you may want to remain anonymous. Uh, you have to read the lines to make sure that you are targeting the journals that will make your identity anonymous as well as your reviewer's identity. Next slide, please. So what are the elements of a good reviewer report? First of all, you have to note that the turnaround time is usually short. Reviews are expected in two to three weeks in most journals. Uh, and things that should be included in a review should include a general assessment of the quality of the science, the data, and images of the manuscript. This is where you briefly summarize the objectives and the main findings of the manuscript and highlight the significance and contribution of the work to the field. Uh, the reports must be easy to read and understand with substantial comments in a logical order. Want to provide an overview of paper's suitability for publication. Uh, this is usually included in the comments to the editor. And they want to specify edits that are needed. This will include identification of major flaws in the manuscript, such as methodological problems, lack of clarity or unsupported conclusion, and provision of special suggestions to address the issue. Also, you want to include minor comments such as typos, grammatical mistakes, and formatting issues, and then provide suggestions that will enhance the clarity and readability of the manuscript. I want to highlight both the strengths and the weaknesses of the manuscript. Reviewers make recommendations to the editor, for example, accept minor revisions, major revisions, or reject. And these recommendations are made with specific reasons uh, and evidence from the review. The editor has the ultimate final decision. I will then turn it over to Jill at this point. Great, so the benefits of reviewing. So peer review is hugely beneficial for each publication, but for the review also, it's a skill enhancing process because as a reviewer, you're refining the study by adding in your own knowledge and a fresh perspective and your own expertise. And on the journal that I work on, we have double anonymized peer review, but recognition can still be obtained through um, Sage discounts and review recognition on the sites that are mentioned on the slides, um, and also being invited to become a volunteer reviewer and later on an editorial board member, which I will go on to. So if we look at the next slide. Um, so there's two main ways in which you can volunteer to review. So the first is by creating an account on the journal's uh, review site. So what's really, really useful is using a regularly checked email address, preferably from an institution, um, updating with all of your your links to your profile, creating an ORCID so that you can get that recognition. It displays all of the peer review um, articles that you've done. 
Um, it's so, so important to include strong keywords. Um, well, particularly for editors like me who are looking at what papers to assign to reviewers, the stronger your and more specific your keywords are, the more useful it is as well. Um, and we've got some good examples of keywords and some, some keywords perhaps you should avoid. Um, the other way in which you could get involved to volunteer to review is by reaching out to editors like me um, directly by email. Um, our email address is usually on the journal website. Um, you can also create a web of science reviewer recognition account as well. And yeah, it's it's a, it's a really great way to then, it's a great way to get onto the editorial board or perhaps even get a taster um, on being an editorial board member. So if we move on to serving on the editorial board, as a next step, um, if you've if you've done some particularly amazing reviews or you've got um, expertise that would like to see represented on the board, you might be asked to serve on the editorial board. Um, if it's something you're also interested in, you you can send in your CV or your resume to the editor and apply to serve. So the editorial board specific composition responsibilities do vary according to the needs and the structure of the journal, but Board members can make an active contribution as reviewers, ambassadors, advisors, and authors. Um, ed board members are asked to conduct peer review, as well as recommend suitable and reliable reviewers within their network. They also represent the journal and they boost its profile and image. They represent prominent names in the field and the key research areas of the journal and the international scholarly community. On the journal that I work on, for instance, we have our traditional editorial board, but we also have our board by expertise. So we've got, on, I work on technology and cancer research and treatment, and we've organized it into detection, diagnosis and prognosis, treatment um, and uh, cancer biology. So that really helps us define which board members go where. And then you've got further subtopics as well that shows off everyone's expertise. Um, furthermore, it's really great to be on the board because you can act as an ambassador um, promoting the journal to potential readers, future authors, um, and you become more knowledgeable about publishing itself, um, knowing key journal information, which would help you in your publishing journey. Um, board members also solicit submissions from within sp specific research and geographical areas, contributing those insights that perhaps us on the other side as editors may not have. So it's great to have an academic insight and expertise. Um, that goes also for editorial strategy, having that different sort of outlook and seeing things from a different way from academia or industry is really useful. Um, so it's always great to hear what's going well or not so well from our board members. And last but not least, being active authors, so submitting articles for publication and also having your encouraging your colleagues to do so. So if we move forward to editorial board member criteria, um, board members are usually selected on the base of one or more of these criteria. So of course, each journal um, editor might take different things into consideration and it also does relate back to the needs of, of the journal itself um, and there's so many different ways in which journals are structured so if we go through this proven and ongoing performance and this can be reflected through your your orchid history and having recognition accounts is really useful to show that having a unique perspective or specialized knowledge um, being in a niche area of research is actually really really useful um, Sometimes we tend to look at what papers are coming in and where our gaps of expertise are. So we really do look for researchers from different topics and subtopics. Um, and that goes on to topical speciality representation within the discipline as well. Um, geographical representation is really, really important. We'd want to ideally pull expertise from each corner of the globe to make sure that everything's represented um, as well as it can be, especially as research is such an international community. Um, institutional representation, so for instance, specific medical centers, universities, academic conferences or coalitions. Um, 
those that have leadership positions and sponsoring or related to professional organizations and many of these people do go on to be quite good guest editors on special collections as well um and lastly freedom so having the time to vote to devote to the journal whether that's looking at manuscripts every so often or providing some ideas for some special collections guest editing depending on what role you're in um they're all really important and crucial for the journal so yeah with that thank you i'll pass on to the to the next speaker all right so um let me take one step back before i talk about deputy editors so generally journals are organized with the uh, editor-in-chief which is kind of like the conductor then they oftentimes have associate and deputy editors, which help advise the editor in chief in terms of submissions. Then we have the editorial board that Simran had just talked about, and those are all members that are formally associated with the journal that also help do reviews and make decisions. And then we have ad hoc peer reviewers, which many of you can join in. So for example, the journal will ask other people who are not formally associated with the journal to do peer reviews and so forth. So let me say a little bit more about the role of the deputy editor, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the editor-in-chief. So deputy editors are kind of like these co-conspirators uh, with the de uh, editor-in-chief, as well as the board in assessing journal uh, uh, policies, and as well as assessing papers and the quality for submission. A lot of times articles will come into a journal and sometimes those articles might be better placed in a different journal. And so the uh, deputy editors will make a decision to maybe reject that article without peer review. So in other words, you bring in your article and they say, well, you know what, this is an article about, I don't know, health policy, but this is not a policy journal. You know, we do more theory and so we're gonna guess reject it so that that article has an opportunity to submit to a different journal that does say health policy. And so, you know, there are other things in terms of fit with the journal that the deputy editors will do in terms of assessing whether it's good, uh, uh, you know, good fit, and then therefore uh, perhaps assign it to reviewers uh, to do their peer review. Um, also, a lot of times uh, articles will come in and it's not quite clear whether it's, we want to accept that article for this journal uh, because, for example, maybe three of the reviewers recommended, uh, you know, like two of them recommended accept, one of them uh, recommended reject. Then we have to make a decision on what do we do? Do we accept that article? Do we reject it? Do we do something else? Send it out for review again. So deputy editors oftentimes will engage in conversation about these articles, about what, what, what are the next steps, what are the final decisions, and so forth. Um, and a lot of times, you know, journals will create special initiatives. Maybe we want a special issue on a given topic. Maybe we want to encourage more student submissions, for example. Maybe we want to have an anniversary issue. Maybe we want to change how things are funded, and so forth. And so a lot of times when journals have initiatives, they have decisions to make, deputy editors will play a key role in, in, in that conversation about what to do. And also some journals will have uh, meetings at societies, for example, and so they'll attend those meetings and you know, give uh, their input and participation. Uh, next slide, please. So the editor-in-chief um, is the person who, you know, has, I guess, you know, the role of managing the journal and all of its operations. Uh, a lot of times, you know, as an editor in chief, you know, what we do is promote the journal content. We try to, you know, increase uh, the visibility of the journal as well as of the authors who are publishing in the journal. Um, we also really try to encourage people to submit, um, you know, articles to the journal with the best methods and, um, and, and, and ideas that are most cutting edge. Uh, there's definitely a lot of ethical issues uh, involved in peer review. These range from things like authorship guidelines, like who is an author, who is not an author, all the way to things like falsification of data, all those kinds of ethical issues. And so the editor-in-chief has to keep a close eye on those ethical issues. There's a lot of issues that are emerging, um, you know, uh, reproduction, re replicability, 
of research in um, science, for example, is the big picture one that many uh, journals and fields are rep, uh, grappling with right now, um, all the way to minor things, or not minor, but more micro level things like citation practices and so forth. So there's a lot of little pieces along sort of uh, that we have to think about with regards to uh, ethics. Um, in addition, there's just all the practical things related to production of the articles. So one thing is, you know, we really want our articles to come out um, in a timely manner. And so part of that, there's a lot of little pieces to how long it takes for you to submit your article before it finally ends up in print. And the edit editorial process is one piece of that. Other pieces of that include the peer review process, uh, and in production time as, uh, you know, with copy editing uh, and those kinds of things. And so the editor in chief, you know, part of their job is really to keep an eye on all of these timelines to make sure everything is moving along. Um, and this also includes responding to author queries. So as, um, as an author, you might send a question to the editorial office and it's part of our job to just respond to those questions as quickly as we can. Um, in addition, we try to keep an eye on the uh, backlog of articles. So generally articles come in, they sit in a queue before they're ultimately published. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we don't have too many articles and the articles are taking three years to get published. Um, and, and so we really want to try to move things along as, as possible. And there's some tools that we can use to uh, try to move things along. And so again, it's really keeping an eye on production. Um, you know, and just to give a quick plug, you know, to my book, and I'll put it in chat. Uh, in my book, you can publish your journal article. We do talk about all these issues related to peer review, publications, and everything else, and why publications are important. Um, and this is told from the perspective of both author, reviewer, and editor. Okay, uh, next slide. And there are other ways you can get involved with a journal. So certainly joining a professional organization like the American Sociological Association, for example, uh, is one good way to get involved with your association as well as you know, ways to meet members of a journal's editorial board, uh, as well as the deputy and editor in chief. Um, you should develop a research profile. There's a lot of different ways you could do this. You know, there's things like LinkedIn, uh, there's things like Google Scholar and so forth. And it's really useful for you to uh, develop a profile for yourself so that as people want to learn more about the work that you're doing, uh, they have access to that. There's a lot of workshops and obviously you're attending one here. Uh, keep an eye out for other workshops by SAGE as well as other professional organizations that oftentimes put these things uh, together. And finally, it's really good to just, you know, remember to be remain patient. If you are actively publishing in your area, uh, eventually uh, journals will start to come to you to get your involvement as a peer reviewer. Um, once you develop a reputation as a peer reviewer, they might invite you onto the editorial board and perhaps to be a deputy editor or even editor in chief. And all these things do take a little bit of time, but with patience, uh, you'll eventually get there. Okay, next slide, and I'll pass it back to Sean. Thank you very much. So thank you, Gil, and thank you to all of our panelists for speaking today on the topic. Um, we're going to move into our Q&A portion in just a moment, but wanted to flag some things that are upcoming from our How to Do Research and Get Published webinar series. So our August webinar is quickly approaching. Um, so this one will be all about um, how to cross paradigms and disciplines through mixed methods methodology. Um, so if you've seen any of our previous talks on methodology, this one is for you. Um, and if you haven't and you're interested, that's definitely a great place to get started. So after the August webinar, um, we have September 18th, how to respond to reviewer comments, which may be closely connected with some of what we've discussed today. Um, and at the end of October, we will have a webinar on how to understand open access, journal publication charges and fee structure. I see a number of questions coming through about open access fees and um, things like that. So this might be a great webinar for you to join. In addition, I wanted to flag our journal resources. On the Sage Journal Author Gateway, there's a dedicated space for author support and services. So you'll see tons of information about how to get published, how to review, how to get started. Um, and this is a really great way, great place to get started as a someone who's looking to learn a little bit more about publishing. 
So first, thank you to our panelists um, and thank you to everyone whose questions are coming through. Um, so the one thing I did want to note is that I see a number of comments coming through about um, slides and certificates of attendance, just to flag that this will be sent out to you via email. So um, don't worry, we I, I, I hear your, your feedback and we'll send that over to you. Um, in addition, I see a number of comments coming through about um, certificates and slides coming from the last webinar. Um, I've noted it and we'll, and we'll look into it further. So now, um, as mentioned, continue to post questions in the Q&A, but we're gonna start with some of the questions that have um, been very popular and some of the questions that have come up most frequently. So my first question to our panelists, uh, the first one, are graduate researchers allowed, graduate student researchers allowed to volunteer to review? Um, basically, what are the qualifications needed to become a reviewer? Yeah, it's, this is definitely possible for graduate students to volunteer for peer review, but this is often dependent on the journal or the editor and whether they're willing to accept that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are some journals with that reviewer and training program, so they may have that opportunity for mentorship, but it, it often requires you just to ultimately ask to see if that's something that they're willing to accommodate. So it's always best to just contact the editor to inquire about it. But most peer reviewers will already have their PhD or an equivalent level experience, but it is definitely very possible for early career researchers to review papers as long as those appropriate steps have been followed as far as contacting the journal and the editor and seeing if you can work around their uh, what they're willing to accommodate. And, and just to add to that, yeah, definitely contact the journal. The other thing is sometimes, um, you know, your professors, if you're a student, will have a lot of requests for peer review. And sometimes uh, a student and a professor will do a peer review together. And it's, it can be a good educational experience. Sean, you're on mute. Good to know. Thank you. No matter how many webinars I do, it still happens. Um, so we have a question here coming through about anonymity. So someone said, I'm not usually comfortable when I amass to review a paper in which names of authors link to the paper in the open or transparent peer approach. Um, so just any feedback on this? Any thoughts? How do you how do you deal with this? And what tips do you have for researchers who may be dealing with this problem? Yeah, uh, open peer review is rare, but still valid, but if the case comes up where you're asked to do open peer review for a journal and they employ this practice and you're not comfortable with participating, it is definitely okay to reject the review and to write back to the editor and explain why. Uh, that's often just the, the best case scenario, just, just to uh, voice that. Um, then they'll likely remove you from the reviewer pool so that you won't be contacted about that again. Great, thank you, Isaac. Anyone else have anything to add or does it, that cover it all? Perfect, thank you. Um, so I've got another question here about basically why to join an editorial board. Um, what are the benefits to it? Are there any benefits that you can think of that is worth sharing with the group? Support membership. Um, in most journals, actually, it's it's a service to the scientific community. It's um, it's a volunteer position, uh, but it comes with a lot of uh, prestige, so to speak, because it's a career development. Before you could be identified as a board member, that shows that you are actually contributing to the field already, and so this is good for you know, for all intents and purposes in many institutions it's one of the points that you're gonna get on your promotion and tenure that you are serving as an editorial board member. And um, you can also be called upon to, to lead um, a special issue uh, from, from the journal based on your expertise and your, you know, uh, your experience serving on the board of, of a journal. Yeah, the only thing I would add, that was a great response, is it's also a good networking opportunity so if you're a member of a board, you get to meet other members of the board who are also part of the discipline and, and, and so forth. And that's also a great side benefit. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, both. Isaac Simmons, does that cover it all? 
Yeah, I feel like that covers it all. I was just going to echo the fact that there's always room for promotion and the more you do and the more you're involved with the journal, um, there's more opportunities. Also, journals have cross-collaboration sometimes as well, so you can get involved with even more journals. So, yeah, I, there's, I think the benefits are endless and we're always coming up with new innovative strategies to try and get more reach. So you should definitely join. <laughs> Thank you, Simran. Good plug. Um, another question that has come through a few times um, is about mentorship and curious from the group here, um, if there's any tips for getting started with a mentorship, what exactly are the benefits and, and how could you use a mentorship to become a better reviewer? Yeah, so uh, I guess there's two points of view here, right? The mentee's point of view and the mentor's point of view. <laughs> so let me start maybe with the uh, mentor's point of view. Uh, the mentor's point of view, this is a great opportunity to help develop the career of your students and so forth. And it's also a good opportunity, especially when, you know, for senior faculty, you know, they get, you know, like tons of requests to review articles, and this might be one way to help manage some of that workload that people are being asked to do. Uh, from the mentee's point of view, um, there's definitely a lot of benefits, uh, you know, in terms of just learning how to do a peer review, how to do it politely, you know, to pay attention to your tone, because like, for example, one of the issues that comes up with junior reviewers is sometimes the tone might come off uh, uh, perhaps a little too bumpy for, you know, and so forth. And one thing that's really important is peer review is the human interaction. And then how do you get involved? Well, as a student, one thing you can do is tell your professors and just say, hey, I'm really interested in learning how to do some peer reviews. You know, if you get asked, um, you know, to review some things on topics X, Y, and Z that I'm interested in, uh, do you think it would be appropriate for me to, you know, help you uh, do a peer review and, and to learn something, you know, learn how to do this? And so that would be win-win. Yeah, I want to mention that there are some journals that actually have some formal uh, internship. That, that you can be an intern with an editorial team and there you can get some mentorship directly from the editorial uh, team. Also, there are opportunities for journal clubs in, in many institutions and that's one way of getting people uh, acclimatized with how papers are written and what are the essential components of a good paper and things like that. That's done at, at institutional level. Yeah, just to add what um to what Dr. Fasero said. So in terms of the journal um internship, so some journals offer uh, um like an opportunity to be an early career researcher. Uh we have a Sage Perspective blog on this as well. Um, but you can basically it's like it's a sort of junior editorial position and over time you get more input from the editor on what they're looking for and you get to demonstrate your work and expertise so if you're perhaps working towards a phd or a qualification that might be a good opportunity and see what journals offer that great thank you simran then thank you um thank you all for answering that question um, yeah, from the from the chat, I see that there are a lot of people who are in a similar situation, a lot of people getting started. So I think that's a really good place uh, for us all to look. So now uh, another question that has come through a few times has to do with institutional affiliation. Um, and one of the questions is, basically, if you are a researcher who is not directly affiliated with the university, what tips do you have? How do you use that to your advantage? Or what what is there any special considerations to take in mind? I think the first thing I want to mention here is um, the your prominence in the field, it's not attached to your university. So basically, if you're an author, irrespective of um, your affiliation, you will pop up uh, when we're looking for reviewers for a particular field. And it doesn't matter if your email address is yahoo.com, Gmail, or what have you. <laughs> the editor or the editorial team will send you a request to review the journal. So basically, what I'm saying here is that um, you could not, you may have retired, you may not be, you may be in um, industry, you may be in any any kind of um, environment outside the academia, 
and you will still your 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 contributions to peer review will still be extremely valuable. Yeah, to add to that, uh, as I mentioned in my slides, uh, basically your research portfolio and your network goes a very long way uh, outside of any particular affiliation with an institution or such. So uh, yeah, really building and bolstering that research portfolio and uh, using that as your 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 sign or, or, or your um, credentials as, as in, a, in a way um, that goes so much longer of a way. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have another question that came through um, asking about transparency. So how do, what do journals do to ensure transparency and minimize the bias of peer review? How does that impact researchers? It, journals do a lot of different things. So one is sometimes they hold training sessions for you know, members of their uh, you know, board and so forth, or the issue policy statements and you know guidelines and how to do reviews and so forth. Um, in addition, a lot of journals will publish um, you know their editorial board names as well as the names of reviewers. They won't connect the reviewers to the specific papers, but they will say something like, "At the end of the year of 2025, the following people have contributed as a peer reviewer to this journal." Um, some journals will also highlight, and again, not connecting the reviewers to specific articles, but they'll say something like, reviewer of the year, you know, is Dr. X, and they might do things like that. Um, and so those are some things, but then journals uh, will also do a little bit of background homework at times. Uh, for example, if there are articles that seem uh, a little questionable in terms of ethical issues and so forth, they might ask the authors for code and they might have reviewers look very carefully at the code and the, the data. Um, you know, we ask people if the journal is blinded, double blinded, you know, of course we try our best from the editorial perspective not to give names and connect people. Um, I, as an editor myself, I've had authors come up to me at conferences to say, oh, I'm pretty sure X, Y, and Z reviewed my paper and I just say nothing. And I would say that probably 80% of the time their guesses are wrong. You know, because you might think, you know, so and so is the perfect reviewer, but chances are that person isn't available because you know they got other things going on. Um, so there are different things uh, like that. And some journals will also have uh, ethical guidelines through their professional societies. Uh, this includes like how do you talk about race, um, you know, in, in your research. Uh, you know, what kind of words do you use? Uh, so, for example, you know, some organizations are saying, like, let's not use words like diabetics and instead, you know, talk about people who uh, have diabetes, for example. And so depending on kind of, you know, where you're working in the space that you're working in, there might be guidelines on things like that uh, to avoid stigmatizing language and so forth. A great point. Yeah, I just want to add that the issue of transparency actually led to the open review uh, by some journals. And um, of course, they now have difficulty in getting people to to take up the review because they don't want to be <laughs> to be identified. So um, but basically in terms of minimizing bias, um, many journals have multiple people reviewing an article. So basically you don't want to have just one person turning into a review and making a decision based on the, on the judgment of one person. So at least um, many journals have three reviewers, at least two um, to, to review a particular, so that the, you can look at all, you know, different perspectives to the journal to reduce uh, bias in, in peer review. Great, thank you, Babalola. Um, I see a lot of questions coming through um, from people. Obviously, we have a very global audience today, which is phenomenal. A lot of people coming from different parts of the world. Um, so I see a lot of questions that are coming through about uh, people who live in lower income countries and what, what tips you might have for them. Um, is there any advice on how to develop your name internationally or globally, um, specifically for those individuals? Um, yeah, so if you've so it's it's really worth checking if your country is part of the research for life program. So there's usually so for this, 
there's um, eligibility in two separate lists. So Group A has like free access um, to content and you can get waived articles as well through the program. Um, and then there's Group B who they fall into low, co low cost access. It's also worth checking if uh, your institution has a sales deal with Sage or publishers generally. Um, and yeah, it's, I think that, that that would be a good way of doing it. Also, if you do get asked to review for Sage, um, you do get automatically added to the reviewer pool. So that sort of widens or furthers more opportunity to review again um, and hopefully get onto the editorial board or have more access and ability to get discounts or waivers um, because as a reviewer on the board as well, a once you review a certain number of articles, you are eligible for particular discounts. Uh, yeah, I just want to add to that to say that also it's important to note that there are many journals that do not charge any fees. And so that might be where we want to start from um, so that you can look at the, the, the journals you're going to submit into. If they don't charge fees, you just put it in there. And many of those journals actually are looking, they are yearning for, for papers from uh, developing countries. Great, thank you, Babalova. And Simran, thank you for your point on um, that Sage authors are automatically added to the reviewer pool. I think this reiterates the point that the, the academic ecosystem is cyclical. Authors are reviewers and reviewers are authors and it kind of all moves around in a nice circle, which is great. Uh, another question that has come through, um, it's just generally, how do you find journals to work on? And, and you know, where do you get started with that? Um, you might find journals through conferences that you attend or if you're not attending conferences, um, having a look at the research that you read and where that's published. Um, quite a few journals are active on X and also LinkedIn. My journal has a journal group on there um, itself. So there's many different ways in which you can, it's, it's great to discover journals through the content itself. Um, yeah, that's I suppose that's a very chronically online approach on how to discover them, but other people might have some other techniques. Is the question specifically on how to discover journals so that you can join their editorial board, or is it just to do, you know, publish in a journal, or is it something else? I think, I mean, from the the publishing side, that's one perspective. I think that we've we've kind of covered that a little bit. You know, you should be looking at the journals that you read, that your your mentors read, all of that. Um, and you know, there's a, a bunch of other ways. But I think more specifically, do you have any tips on finding maybe ed boards or journals where you can gain traction within an ed board? I I guess I would think about it from the point of view of the kind of research that you do. So think about the research that you do and where where do you want to situate your research? Like what's the audience for your research? And then I would start publishing in a couple of those journals. And those are the journals that you might want to just start thinking about in terms of making an inroads to joining that editorial board. But I would just kind of really nearly like do a Google search, like which journals have editorial boards and just try to jump in. But it's really think about your program of research and how, what's the community that you want, that is a good fit for you? And there is a tool online, which is called the Journal Hotho Name Estimator, which uh, short name for that is Jane, J-A-N-E, which you can look at uh, uh, in Google. There you can actually put your area of interest in, the, in a box in there. You can find journals, you can find authors, you can find artic articles. So if you put substance use, for example, it will, it will list journals that are in that particular domain for you. And then you can look at, and then it will tell you um, actually the strength of the journal and some other uh, things that you can look that, that might be interesting to you. Yeah, oh, and I wanted to add one other thing. Think about the journals that you like to read and the journals that you're citing. And then those are sort of another way to make a natural connection for you. 
Yes, great point. Thank you. One last thing I would also mention that uh, if you are a consistent peer reviewer and have done multiple reviews for a particular journal uh, and are reliable and consistent and so on and so forth, then there may be an opportunity for that editor to invite you onto the editorial board if that is a possibility. Or you can even request, and sometimes that can be uh, like a, a mutual uh, desire, I suppose. Yeah, so I just remember another way you can use that tool I just mentioned is when you request, when you have requests to review, there are many uh, pediatric journals out there that if you're not sure of, you can just do a quick search to know if it's worth your time um, because there are many of those that are not credible that are just out there asking you to review for them. Yes, very good point. Have to be careful of predatory journals to make sure you're finding the right journal, but also a good journal. Um, I see a very interesting question that came through and it has to do more with, um, it deals with career progression, but um, Gil and Babalola, I think this might suit you best. Um, question is, when when do you know is the right time? When when are you ready to become an editor, an associate editor? When When do you feel, at what point should one look to do that in their career if you have any advice? You can go first. Oh. Well, this is this is a, a balancing act. You know, sometimes you want to see where you are in your career because it's a lot of work. And so if as a as a new investigator that you you're spending so much time as an editor, that might not help you in your on the long run. So basically, you want to be sure of where you are in your career tra trajectory. Do you have enough publication yourself? Do you have enough grants under your belt? Do you have things that would, that if you now put a chunk of your time working for a journal, it will be beneficial to you than being detrimental. So you have to really balance it out to know where you are in your career trajectory. I, I don't know how to simplify it more than that. And I, I think Jill might do it better than I, I can. No, I, I was going to say the same thing. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think so. If if we think of like uh, the ranks of assistant, associate, and, and full professor as one example, there's other, of course, ways to think about our career progression. Um, it's, it's really hard as an assistant professor, for example, to become like an editor in chief uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, the time commitment is huge. Uh, you mean, you're still trying to build your own career and you may not have standing in the field. And so that's another thing. Uh, this can happen, especially at some of the predatory journals where they're just kind of looking for names and anybody with a PhD uh, and, and mailing address, you don't even have to be alive. So it feels like sometimes, um, you know, they'll, they'll ask you to do things. Um, but especially when you're very junior, I, I would really, personally recommend that you focus your energies on building your own career, getting your research together, getting your articles out, getting grants, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> then if you move into associate professor and then maybe full professor, those are times where you might really want to start thinking, is this a good move for me? Uh, because, you know, it's an opportunity cost, because especially as an editor-in-chief, that's a huge time commitment. Um, and so, you know, and, and you're responsible for a lot of what's going on with the journal. Um, and sometimes when things happen and you have to worry about things like lawsuits and things like that, you know, do, do you have the time and capacity to take on those things? If reviewers start to get persnickety and there's ends up sometimes in peer review, authors and reviewers, they start to have arguments. And then do you feel like you need to jump in? Those are really difficult moments. Um, as an editor, and do you really want to get involved in those kind of arguments? Um, and especially when you're really junior in your career, to end up perceiving to pick a side might not be good for you or for your reputation. And so there's a lot of difficulties in these roles, but even if they do come with prestige, and you really learn a lot. You learn a lot about people, actually, more so than anything else, From at least from what I got out of this. Um, so... So I, I guess I would really think hard about where you are, what your goals are, um, and your time commitments, you know, currently as well as the next few years for that time for the editorial capacity. And also, just as importantly, you know, a lot of times as you pick on the role of editor-in-chief, you have the opportunity to bring on editorial board members, um, deputy editors, and so forth, and then who will be part of that team. 
um, because you don't want to go in alone. Uh, going in alone is going to be really, really hard. So think about your team. Do you have people, you know, that you can call upon that, you know, can help you? Because uh, once you're in that role and then you start having to manage and you have to start, you know, the whole thing of picking reviewers for articles, you are asking thousands of people to do favors for you. Right. And not just once. Right. Especially in established journals, you will be asking those same people for a few years. Can you review this article? Can you review this article? Can you review this article? You know, you can only call in so many favors. Um, and so if you're, you know, it's just another thing to consider. Great. Thank you very much, Gil. And thank you, Babalova. Great answer uh, to a great question. And we've got one last question um, before we wrap up for the day. And this question is about self-promotion. Um, how, what, do you have any tips or any advice on how to promote yourself to show that you're interested for the position and that you're ready? Um, is there an appropriate way to do you actively reach out or wh how do you best advertise yourself as appropriate for, for an editor role? Yeah, I think one thing you could do is talk to the current editor in chief and the deputy editors and just kind of float the idea like, hey, I'm kind of interested. What's the job like? You know, what do you think? And those kinds of things. You know, if they think that you'd be a good candidate, they they would probably be very encouraging. Um, if they're some some people have a good poker face, but some people might kind of subtly try to discourage you for whatever reason. Um, and it's good to kind of listen as best as you can in between the lines. But yeah, it, it, I think it's a good thing to just let people know that you you are interested. I didn't I didn't advertise anything. I just got a nomination one day. I was like, oh, I don't think I'm a good guy for this job. But these things come along like once in a lifetime. I'll just throw my hat in the ring and see what happens. And next thing you know, you're running. So. And. Um... Just to add to that, I mean, we, we mentioned networking earlier on, and one way to do that is through uh, your participation in societies. Most, most of the journals, they have, they are owned by societies or associations, and they have conferences, they have meetings. And at that, that such meetings, for example, they actually let people know that there are open positions uh, that members of the society or association might uh, may, may be interested in. So that's another way to, to do it. Yes, great point, thank you. Um, I thought it also might be worth saying that for Sage Open Access Journals, like on every single landing page, we have um, a link at the bottom that says like interested in joining editorial review board. Um, it usually has like a link to our to our surveys that you can fill in and send to us. And it says like what we're looking for specifically as well. So that gives a good idea. Um, then when you do apply, we end up sending a memorandum of understanding, which is like the roles and responsibilities. Um, so you'll feel fully informed. And I think it's really, really good also to try and be, um, try and have a presence. Um, what I mean by that is having like ORCID and Web of Science verified. So that's really useful for us to see and verify you um, if you're interested. Yeah, and one last thing to add about that is uh, Sage has an open editor's position page that does list all the current openings for any journal that's uh, primarily looking for uh, around like section editors or associate editors or editors in chiefs. So usually like around the higher levels of the editorial board, but uh, we do have those and we advertise those regularly. And um, so that's a great opportunity if you're looking for more of those leadership high, uh, higher end roles. Great. Thanks, Isaac. And thank you all. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our call today. So huge thank you to my Sage colleagues, Isaac and Simran, for, for leading this and to Gil and Babalola for their expertise uh, in the subject area. Huge thank you to everybody who is joining us today. Um, as mentioned before, I will follow up with an email to you all with the slides um, and a certificate of attendance and all of that. Um, definitely hope to see you at a future webinar. In addition, we have our How to Be a Peer Reviewer webinar series, which actually is a great tie-in with this particular webinar. So if that's something you're interested, be in the lookout there. But otherwise, I hope to see you in a future webinar. And in the meantime, take care.